Hello and welcome everybody to this Thursday live edition of Dodgers Territory. We are your hosts. I am Alana Rizzo. That is Clint Pasillas. And Clint, my goodness, when we were getting ready to do the show earlier today, we had no idea that we were going to have this much to unpack. But there is some late breaking news about Shohei Otani and really more so about his interpreter, Ipe Mizuhara. Are you all right there, Clint? Are you that upset about what's right, going I got, on? I got with the double, uh, double noises coming. So you just keep talking, I'll, I'll kill it, and then uh, there we go. <laughs> An unbelievable amount of information coming out about what's going on in the Ipe Mizuhara situation. Of course, the Dodgers firing him last month because of a connection to perhaps stealing money from Shohei Otani. We thought at the time, the number at the time that was given was $4.5 million. It looks like it is upwards of 15 or more million, $16 million being stolen from Shohei Otani, Clint. This from Jeff Passan. Ipe Mizuhara has been charged with stealing more than $16 million from Shohei Otani according to federal investigators. And what's crazy as we get into the big ticket here is that Ipe has actually admitted to stealing from Shohei. Yeah, this is a lot to take in for sure. So let, let's, let's give a breather. Do we want to throw big ticket graphics on the screen? I don't, did I miss that? I'm sorry. I, I you, were trying, you were trying to uh, stop all the noise and music coming out of your, uh, your I, system there. I was really excited for this show because there's a lot. Sixteen million dollars stolen over the course of what was it like three three solid years, even up to including this year. Uh, you got a, a bank account set up by Shohei and and uh, and Ipe. You got people asking about the account getting shut out in this uh, situation. Uh, this is this is absurd. This is going to make a hell of a documentary on Netflix in about five or ten years. I hate that it even had to get to this point, but I want to make something very clear. It was a federal investigation that was done into the allegations that Ipe Mizuhara was stealing from Shohei Otani. It is very clear that Shohei Otani is the victim in this situation. The U.S. attorney, Martin Estrada or Martin Estrada, depending upon what language you're using and interpretation and language is important in this case, said that Shohei Otani is the victim and did not know that this was going on. Now, on the other side, people are saying, how in the world does somebody not notice $16 million being taken from their bank account? Well, it was also said that Ipe Mizuhara was setting up bank accounts, having the settings changed, so alerts and notifications were not going to Shohei Otani. And in fact, Ipe was even trying to shut out the rest of Shohei Otani's circle, including Agent Nez Bolello. So he was in so deep that he was trying to shut everybody out and continue to have these activities, illegal activities, on Shohei Otani's accounts. It, at some point, they say the shit is going to hit the fan. Uh, Ipe was orchestrating something pretty elaborate and insane. But uh, again, shit, meat fan here. Like you said, the victim here is Shohei Otani. A couple quotes I'll read you guys. We're not going to have them on the screen, but you can find them on the internet. Uh, this one coming from uh, uh, the the U.S. attorney. Our investigation revealed due to the position, uh, position of trust that he occupied with Mr. Otani, Mr. Mizuhara, had unique access to Mr. Otani's finances, and he used and abused that position of trust in order to take advantage of Mr. Otani. And that's where, you know, you can kind of understand, yeah, this is a guy, we, we he makes a lot of money. Maybe people like me, people like you will notice, uh, well, I'll definitely notice $4.5 or $16 million missing from my account. But if you have somebody that uh, we saw how much they at least the, it looked like they loved each other. Uh, I'm pretty sure they did love each other on on uh, when we did see them publicly. But um, you give somebody that position of power, that kind of trust, they could take advantage. And that's the situation we see Shohei fully taken advantage of. And I don't think this is a situation where they're trying to you know, use him as a fall guy, use Ipe as a fall guy. This is what we're seeing is reality. The text messages corroborate this between the bookmaker, between Ipe, and this thing just keeps getting nastier and nastier. This is some Breaking Bad epic level shit. The, the <laughs> amount of betrayal and dishonesty that had to have happened to someone that you thought, it's almost like his brother, right? I mean, think about the, the person in your circle that is the closest to you, the person that you trust to have your best intentions in mind, 
to make sure that you're protected, to make sure that you're safe, to make sure that you're secure. And I don't want to hear that he was just an interpreter because Ipe was not just an interpreter. You can talk to any person that has ever served as an interpreter or a translator or a liaison to anybody in professional sports. It doesn't even have to be just Major League Baseball. Just being an interpreter is probably at the bottom of the list of responsibilities of what these people have to do. They are in charge of making sure that all of your services in the community are set up, that you know how to go to get a driver's license, that you can go and purchase a vehicle, that you can go to a bank and open up an account. And again, when it when you're talking about the amount of money we're talking about here, it's all relative. I don't care if you have $100,000 in your bank account or if you have $100 in your bank account or 100 million in your bank account. If I had 100,000 thousand dollars in my bank account, I would notice if 400, you know, if 45,000 was gone. So if you have a hundred million, I'm still going to notice if 4.5 is gone. You know, it's, it's all relative in terms of that. But if Shohei Otani didn't even know that the accounts existed or that Ipe was setting this up or moreover that he was contacting the banks himself, pretending that he was Shohei Otani, obviously speaking in Japanese and, and acting as if he was that person impersonating him to get these accounts set up or these transactions handled. Here's another question for thought. What book maker or illegal bookmaker is going to allow your debts to get that high? I don't, I don't gamble illegally. I don't know how this works, but isn't there some sort of like baseline that you, once you get past that, you're no longer allowed to bet. You would assume in the in the interest of making money, and there were uh, in the full uh, report that came out from uh, you know government report, whatever we want to call uh, this situ or this this document that came out, thirty seven page document. There's a, a butt ton, uh, if we're using legal jargon here, of text messages between the two, between Ipe and uh, Bauer or Bowyer or whatever uh, the the bookmaker. Um, where he, Ipe kept asking, Hey, can you give me more? Can you give me more? Can you give me more, uh, uh, leash in, in how much I could bet, or, you know, I'm good for it. And eventually the money started coming, uh, uh from Shohei's account. Uh, you know, we see here on the screen, you know, the bets do not appear to have been about baseball or on baseball, which is an important situation or important point there. Uh, I mean, either way, it's not going to help if it's $16 million, uh, missing from your account over a number of years. But, um, Lost my train of thought on that one. A lot of money, a lot of craziness. And that's that's how I'll button this up. I had something good, then I got distracted. <laughs> I think the point is that Shohei Otani was a victim in this. The, the point is also that if, in fact, Shohei was involved, which he is not, according to this U.S. investigation, it is a federal investigation. So I'm going to assume that they did their due diligence. And if, he, if they say that he is a victim in this, I'm going to go with he's a victim in this. However, if he was involved in this, had they been betting on baseball, that would have been way worse than what's already happening here. So it wasn't apparently betting on baseball. This was all done at the hands of Ipe Mizuhara, to my knowledge, without Otani's knowledge and trying to make sure everybody else in his circle of trust was not aware of what was going on. If you're trying to make sure that the agent doesn't even know with what what's happening with your client, that that's a massive, massive problem. Yeah. And we see, we saw the tweet a couple of seconds ago there from Jason Stark losing bets, $182.94 million, the winning bets, 142.27. So he did win some money and another one of the, odd painful things here is that when the money was going out it was leaving Shohei Otani's account when it was coming back in it was going it into was Ipe's his account which uh I, I mean how do you I know the guys on foul territory were just talking about this too like how do you how do you get around the tax situation of that I don't know I, I like you listen, I don't really listen doubt I don't I don't think the guys really worried about the tax liability if you're willing to bet illegally with an illegal bookmaker and you're willing to steal from your friend I don't think that you're probably the most credible or by the book type of guy so siege roots has a super chat we always appreciate that so much epay's actions are straight up addict behavior true but instead of selling and he's flat screen for meth <laughs> he had otani's bank account man put auntie's flat yeah. screen back she worked very hard for that flat screen yeah i mean that's the thing we're talking big bucks on the biggest superstars bank account that this game has ever seen what a tragedy absolute tragedy um i i liked well i don't like it but 
uh, watching the kind of uh, sequence unfold in the the revealed text messages between the two between Ipe, where he kind of where he eventually admitted like no I'm I'm cooked like this was me this Shohei doesn't know about this this is all going to go bad and you know the the bookmaker trying to get information about like what's going to come out in the LA Times because obviously now this guy's uh, totally legitimate business is uh, is pretty screwed over in this situation but. Um, to reiterate here, Shohei Otani is the victim of this, and I don't want to hear people out there online talking about, like, how do you – he makes a lot of money, and and this was done over a number of years, and this was a guy that he, he very much trusts. He, or Shohei ha, did not – I fully believe Shohei had zero – to do with this situation he didn't know what was going on this is this is a dude that just loves going out and playing baseball getting ready for a baseball game and that's all he cares about he doesn't care about gambling betting and that's i believe that to my core you know what's so funny noah ortega is is chiming in right now on the super chat which i appreciate this is funny because i was just honestly thinking about this situation too <laughs> noah had to say he's got a wife now to help watch the money and it's funny that he says that because these things were happening apparently these transactions were happening from 2000 and what 2021 to 2024 Shohei Otani made about eight and a half million just in baseball. I'm not talking about endorsements and those types of things. He made about eight and a half million in 2021 and 2022. 2023, he got $30 million in payroll from the Angels and then, of course, left in, as a free agent and came to the Los Angeles Dodgers. So you have to think about the fact that the, the majority of stuff was probably happening in the 2023 year maybe because that's when Shohei was making the most amount of money in terms of payroll but it's like you have to think about the fact I doubt Shohei Otani just met his wife two months ago and married her so she was probably already even though we didn't know about her she was probably already in that inner circle and that small circle of trust that Shohei Otani had and even she didn't know about any of this even she's not paying attention or privy to the money and the accounts and those types of things that are happening with this so Ipe Mizuhara this was probably something that I would imagine was happening over the course of a, of a long period of time and it finally got caught up to him yeah out of control uh our guy scott braun brings up a good point in the uh in the chat here i want to ask you alana so you do get people asking the question people wondering why is shohei otani not like on administrative leave in this situation tell people why shohei otani is not on administrative leave because he didn't do anything wrong I mean, this oh. is something where you, you, I mean, if they on it, think about this guys, we, everybody thinks that they're judge, you know, judge, jury and executioner. He had a federal investigation done. And for those conspiracy theorists out there that still think that the U S government and that the federal government, the Dodgers, the league, and everyone's like covering up Shohei Otani, no one is going to take the fall for Shohei Otani. Okay. He didn't do anything wrong. And the U.S. government was very adamant and very clear that Shohei Otani participated fully in the investigation. You think that Shohei Otani is going to say, no, I'm not going to turn over my accounts to you. I don't have to do that. Bullshit. If the U.S. government is at your door telling you to turn over all your stuff and they have a warrant for whatever that is in your house or your car or your whatever, they're going to get it. They're the government. That's how it works. So the reason that Shohei Otani is not on administrative leave is because there was no need to put him on administrative leave. The U.S. government didn't have a case against him. The league doesn't have a case against him. And the Dodgers did the right thing. As soon as it was found out that Ipe Mizuhara was doing this stuff, the Dodgers fired his ass. Yeah, That's why he's not on administrative leave. Because he didn't do anything wrong and he cooperated the entire time. There's a lot more no. behind the scenes that we don't know what's going on. But I guarantee you, if they thought for one second Shohei was involved in this, he would have been gone immediately, even if it is the unicorn of the sport. We've never seen a guy like this. Yeah, they don't care if you're the golden goose. You will get your come up and you will uh, face some sort of penalty if you did something wrong. But another quote from the presser today, Mr. Otani has cooperated fully and completely, not only in, spe uh, in speaking to investigators, he also provided access to all of his devices, personal and personal information to ensure justice. Shohei was taken aback. He was as shocked as anybody in this situation. If anything, more shocked because that was his boy. That was his BFF. That was his road dog, quite literally, because they were on the road all together. And now, not and fired and going to jail for a very, very long time.
Yeah, I guess the, the maximum penalty for this type of, of fraud is 30 years. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen as far as the sentencing is concerned. But again, when I saw early this morning that Ipe Mizuhara was negotiating a guilty plea, I thought to myself, how can you negotiate a guilty plea? But then it was mentioned, it's like, you know what? He could have said, you know what? I didn't do this. I'm not guilty. But then if he were to be found guilty, which it seems like he is, then the sentence and the penalty and the punishment would have even been worse. So you know what? Say that you're guilty. Take, you know, take your licks and you might you have a lot of time, my man, right now to think about bets when you're in, in, the, in a jail cell for 30 years. Uh, I hope it was worth it. I hope it was worth stealing from your best friend and, and lying to everybody. And, and now you, uh, you have a lot of time to think. A lot of time to think. I think we should think about moving on to another unsavory Dodgers headline involving uh, the julio urias uh situation you want to fill us in on what's uh what the latest is there yeah i think it's just it's basically just to put an end to this i mean we knew that julio urias was again you know on administrative leave or however you want to say that because again an investigation showed that he did something he wasn't supposed to do so most recently that came out about him this is from fabian ardaya who does a great job covering the dodgers on a daily basis can confirm tmz's report that former dodgers left-handed pitcher julio urias is facing five misdemeanor charges attempt or skimming stemming rather from his step September arrest, according to LA City Attorney's Office, his arraignment is scheduled for May 2nd. So again, not much more to go into this. We just knew that he wasn't going to be a Dodger, and now it doesn't look like he's ever going to pitch again. Bill Plunkett with the OC Register, district attorney back in January, elected not to pursue felony charges, but LA City Attorney has charged former Dodgers Julio Urias with five misdemeanors related to domestic violence. Urias is still an unsigned free agent and under MLB investigation. So that kind of goes back to Shohei Otani. He didn't have to be under administrative leave because the due diligence was done and he didn't do anything wrong where it looks as Julio Urias, unfortunately, has done something wrong. The first time this happened with Julio, I was still with the team. I said, I don't think so. I saw the footage. I gave him a pass. But if it continues to happen, now he no longer gets a pass and he will never pitch in the big leagues again, Clint. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Uh, this is going, he's eventually going to get the longest suspension ever handed down by baseball, if not a lifetime suspension, which would be the longest suspension uh, ever handed down. And for, I haven't seen the video footage. I don't want to see the video footage. I've heard enough about the video footage. It's awful. It's nasty. It's it's disgusting. And that's not somebody that should be representing Major League Baseball or the Dodgers ever again, for sure, but any Major League Baseball team. Yeah, no question about it. And uh, he's never going to pitch again, and he shouldn't. If you put your hands on a woman and, and it's proven in, you know, in the court of law that that's what you've done, then you, sh you shouldn't be able to pitch this great game. All right, moving on from the bad stuff, how about we talk about some good stuff finally? Moving on to behind the scenes. Let's talk about baseball. That's what we're here for. This is supposed to be a fun program. I'm all fired up. I'm pissed off now. All right. The, the are, good, are, though. I don't know. Feisty or Rizzo, is, it just depends. It depends on what, what side of the coin you're on. All right, Tyler Glasnow straight fire Dodgers are 3 0 with him on the bump 14 Ks in under 90 pitches which is a uh I think it's a record since they've been tracking pitches since 1988 um wow this I I said you know all all the the headlines went to signing Shohei Otani this offseason they went to signing Yoshinobu Yamamoto this offseason but that trade could loom large as the biggest acquisition of the offseason. I'm going to say the biggest trade that uh, happened in baseball uh, you know, since last October. All right. I'm going to go ahead and give credit to Brad Paisley, because if you read Ken Rosenthal's article and he talked about it very eloquently on fair territory a couple of weeks ago, he talked about the fact that the Dodgers brass and the Rays brass was at Brad Paisley's like, barn or home or whatever in Nashville, Tennessee, and had some very, very, very nice whiskey. And Brad said, listen, if you want this type of, it's like Pappy Winkle, I don't drink whiskey, so I don't know what the heck it is. Tweet us and let us know, get it in on the chat and what the hell it was. But if you want this whiskey, then Tyler Glasnow needs to become a Dodger. And I tell you what, he has been everything that the Dodgers needed. Now I have, I want to ask you about this. 88 pitches, seven innings of work. Dave Roberts takes him out. Thoughts? Are you all right with that? 
At this point in the season, I'm pretty all right with that. I would say this is the guy that is the most built up of any pitcher in the starting rotation, but I'm okay with him coming out after 88 pitches. He didn't have a no-hitter going like we saw with Clayton Kershaw. I think it was a year or two ago also in Minnesota where he had the uh, the no-hitter going, but Dave took him out. I think it was after six innings because it was fairly early in the season and you have to worry more about down the road. So it wasn't the most it wasn't going to be a record setting game i'm okay with him coming out after 88 pitches he did his job and you got other guys in there and a day off today you mentioned other guys in there this is a good point made by you and you didn't even know the segue i was getting into because you look at ronel blanco of the houston astros right clint who ended up having the first no hitter of 2024 and just hit his eighth major league start he threw 105 pitches he had never gone past seven innings he had never you know thrown more than 100 pitches but espada let him go out and go the distance and finish the game that's because the astros are reeling right now the dodgers yeah. have enough of a depth in their pitching staff and enough in their you know starting lineup and whatever to be able to take a guy out and not need him to make a statement espada needed ronel blanco to go out there and throw that no-no yeah talk to me also when he's on the il in like two months because of misuse uh, okay but I mean, he, he's still a young guy. I, I can, I'm, my point is like, you got to see, like yeah. the point is Dave Roberts has the luxury to take out Glass now because he's coming off a year in which he threw the most innings ever because he has the lineup that he has and he has enough depth in his starting rotation. The Astros do not. I'm just comparing the 2017 yeah. team to a 2017 team. That is all. We're happy to see the Astros. I'm happy. Dodgers fans are happy to see the Astros struggling. Oh, boo-hoo. No, I'm not. I'm not asking for sympathy for the Astros at all. Uh, on, the on, the, on the contrary, I'm saying we're better. We are, we're, we're deeper. We have a better pitching staff, and we have a better lineup. That, that's all I'm saying. All right, it's let's fair. talk about good Shohei Otani. I mean, he, okay. it doesn't seem like all this off-the-field bullshit is affecting him on the field. Look at what his numbers are so far offensively. Hey, the Dodgers' number one cricket player uh, in the lineup, Shohei Otani, been on a tear. Uh, what was the record again? 12 extra base hits through the first, teen, uh, first 14 games of the season. That's the most for a Dodger ever. When the, bat, when the ball comes off of this dude's bat, it just sounds different. This is a man that, that hits the hell out of a baseball. And um, – I think the Dodgers got a good one. What do you like about the, this Shohei hot streak? Because it's not even, I mean, this is, this is a man that's on fire. People forget that Shohei Otani had 44 home runs last year. It's like, you guys, it's the first two weeks of the season. It's, it's freezing out in a lot of places that these guys have gone. They've played in Chicago. They've played in Minnesota. It's, we're not even into May yet. Give, give it a break. And there's a good point that maybe all of these games are kind of spring training anyway for the Dodgers until you get to October. There's not a person out there that doesn't think that the Dodgers are going to win the are not going to win the NL West, right? They're going to win 100 games, they're going to win the West, but that doesn't matter if they don't get past the first round. A lot of people would say it doesn't matter if they don't get to the World Series and win it. So if you don't get out of the first round, and you get swept in the flipping wild card or whatever it is, or by a team that's a lot worse than you, it doesn't matter what you do in the regular season. So Shohei Otani having the most extra base hits, I'm not surprised, but I also wouldn't be freaking out if he had two extra base hits right now. What they're doing, there's not a person that so far, I think in the game, like in the first 10 games or whatever it's been for the Dodgers, of the top three in the order, there's not been a game that one of those guys hadn't gotten a hit. So there's not going to be any prolonged slumps with this lineup. Be happy about the depth that this team has for the love of God. It's a deep team, but it's not a team without its issues. We've seen one of the issues kind of pop Bro, up. You are negative Nancy teams. today. You are negative Nancy today. I, I got somebody in the comments saying I'm being a homer here. Oh, so I don't know. I'm just I want to talk about Alex Vesia for a second because this was somebody that I was chirping about to, to shift gears. He doesn't look good, Clint. He doesn't. He doesn't look good. You're I, right. I was chirping about him all off season. If you're looking, if this is a, an off season where this Dodgers team was trying to maximize every single position, they kept upgrading. You had like Manuel Margot. Oh, you want the upgrade to Kike Hernandez? We'll go and get that. Uh, you know, getting some help in the form of of Tyler Glass now and uh, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. They had a clear need in starting rotation. They went and helped that. It alleviated the problem. Also adding in James Paxton. But there was one kind of glaring issue that stood out 
and it just kept standing out all even into spring training. And that was they have one left hander in the bullpen. And it's Alex Vesia, and he is a guy that has trouble sometimes knowing where his pitches are going. And sometimes his pitches go right down the middle and the ball goes out of the ballpark. <laughs> uh, by the way, happy birthday, Alex Vesia. I don't want to crap on you too hard right now. I apologize. But a couple homers, back to back games. And a lot of walks, 10, uh, 10 batters, 10 of the 30 batters that he has faced have reached base, six walks, one hit batter, three hits, including homers in the past two games. How do you get this guy back on track? He says he's feeling back on track. What do you do in this situation? I'm not sure, but I wonder too, with Alex Vezia, as well as Michael Grove, who we'll talk about a little bit more too, how long is the leash on both of these guys. If you take a look at the number of Vezia splits as I look on my screen here, in 2021 and 2022, he had an opponent's average against of 537. So far in 23 and 24, 751. The ERA is north of four in the last two seasons versus below two and a half in 21 and 22. Michael Grove, who we're going to get into, worst ERA among NL pitchers since the start of 2003 and 23, Clint. Michael Grove has the worst ERA in the National League, minimum 75 innings pitched at 6.49. I mean, this the bullpen is the one part of a team that I feel always keeps general managers and president of baseball operations guys up at night. How do you fix this? What do you do in this situation with these two guys? I don't know. Again, if you're gonna if you're gonna get rid of them, who do you have replace them? Sometimes the you know the the evil you know is better than the evil that you don't. But how long can you go with them performing this way? Yeah, I mean, you know this front office better than most. They're always on the phones. They're always monitoring who's available. They just made uh, a trade with the Yankees a couple days ago, picking up uh, the designated for assign assignment lefty pitcher Nick Ramirez. Um, they you know, brought back Matt Gage after releasing him, who's another lefty. They have options there for just looking at lefty, uh, left-handed options. Uh they find ways to find guys. People, people on the internet, Dodgers fans will call them, you know, like like the scrap heap guys. I mean, we'll be on Dodgers fans. We'll call them scrap heap guys. Andrew Friedman in this front office, they love working, working there, operating there, finding those diamonds in the rough, and they will find some. A la Ryan Brazier. Um, we've seen plenty of Joe Blanton in the past that will find these guys that will fix these sort of problems, help these problems. Your Evan Phillips is of the world. But right now, if we're looking for things to complain about. We're going to complain about some things. All of that to say, still a very damn good ball team. It's still the first team in the National League to 10 wins. They're still in first place. And like you said, Alana, they're going to go out there and they're going to win 100 games easy. And they're going to win that National League West. Yeah, this uh, Twitter handle was giving me an aneurysm. Can we go back to, it's like lunar activity, carnivorous. Oh, carnivorous lunar activity. Wow, so, that one was giving. Me, he look. He was saying that Alex Vezia looked like he was frustrated in his post season, post game. Um, yeah, I'm sure he is. I'm sure. I mean, nobody wants to go out there and get shelled. Nobody wants to go out there and get lit up like a Christmas tree. These guys want to throw strikes. They want to get guys out. Nobody wants to let their team down. It's not like they're not trying. So I'm sure that he was frustrated in his post game. I would be frustrated too. Hopefully, he turns things around. And that's the thing when you have a deep team, you know the 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 spots that aren't performing are more magnified but there is a deep enough team to help pick up the middle relieving core that's not performing at its best all right time now for bleeding blue and it was on this day and i wasn't with the team yet i know you were watching the game i saw the game but i wasn't covering the game at the time back in 2013 as we get ready for the la and san diego series uh, starting tomorrow the zach granky carlos quentin brawl what do you remember about this clip Zach Greinke's one of my favorite people, by the way. That was an all-time. That was like Greinke's, I think, second or third game in Dodger Blue. And he had to throw in on Quentin. They had a history. And apparently Carlos Quentin had said, the next time he throws, I'm going to go get that mf -er. And he did. And you know what? Greinke took it. He lowered the boom. And we got some all-time uh, great Vin Scully calls in that situation as the whole fracas oh, is going yeah. On the screen, that's fertilizer. It's oh, not what Matt that that was so great. So Matt Kemp obviously um has never been one to mince words. And I do love the way that Zach Rinke just kind of lowered his shoulder. He ended up breaking his collarbone, which sucks. But a lot of pitchers would have been like, Oh god, I'm just gonna hide behind my catcher. I'm not gonna do any of this. No, no, no. Zach Rinke was like, you know what? Let's go. He's the he's the most honest human I've ever met, by the way. But Matt Kemp was like, This is boop, boop. 
and Vince Scully, as you said, kept saying, Matt's saying this is fertilizer and we couldn't get the call cleared in time. That was an ultimate Vince Scully call talking about fertilizer, but you can use your imagination about what Matt Kemp was actually saying. Yeah, it was bullshit. <laughs> no, it was, we, uh, yeah. I don't even think there was, I don't even think there was any bull. Uh, yeah. I think you yeah. were saying this is. Wait, hmm. well, man, you know, that's one of those things too. I missed from that team that the feisty younger Matt Kemp, just, uh, he was ready to tear off some heads. That was a fun club. Just, uh, just before, I mean, not to say you, you, you spectrum, uh, sports in LA people came along and took away the fun. Cause you made it more accessible. <laughs> you made it better, but you missed a good one. Uh, just one year before you joined. I don't the team. know. Cause I gotta say 2014 was a shit show of a clubhouse. So 2013 was the, the second half is when Yasiel Puig came up, right? He like burst onto the scene. It was unbelievable. And then 2014 was when he was there for a year. But you had a lot of crazy personalities that year in 2014. You still had Juan Uribe. You still had uh, Yasiel. You had Matt. You had Hanley Ramirez. So there was a lot of guys that wanted to be the superstar and the man, not necessarily Uribe, but, you know, like Ramirez, Kemp. Puig, and I love Matt Kemp to death, but I thought when Matt Kemp came back, he was much better to deal with than when he, and I've known Matt for a billion years, like the whole time I've been in the NL West. So I feel like I can say that because I would say that to his face, but you know, the ethers of the world, that was a very um, tense clubhouse in 2014. And that was one of Donnie's last years, I think um, yeah, before the new yeah. regime, the new regime came in and then Dave Roberts like took over in what 16 or whatever it was, but that was a difficult clubhouse. And it was, it was not a clubhouse in which it was a lot about character. It was more like me, me, me. And that was a, that was a, that was a tough one to deal with. So, um, and then it, and then it changed. And then you saw what happened, you know, subsequently after that. Yeah, you can see why Don Mattingly was the way he was in his little exit conference. Like, hey, I ain't coming back. He was you know, arms well, up, I very standoff. Yeah, stand back. I mean that that was a weird presser with him and Ned Coletti, right? That was a really uncomfortable, awkward thing. And Donnie baseball is old school. He's not dealing with like like Puig, you know, showing up late on opening day and and all the, the crap that, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, all the this crap. That, that club, but, uh, the difference ten years makes, I guess, huh? Yeah, it's different. Um, all right, what do you what do you got on all Dodgers tonight? By the way, your shows it's Thirsty Thursday. Thirsty Thursday. We'll probably be sipping on another whiskey cola because that is what I enjoy doing on a Thirsty Thursday. As we get in here to Last Licks, and you know what? I want to see. I want to see the uh, graphic. Let's play some Last Licks. <laughs> Listen All a lot. Right. Anytime yes. I can see dogs on the TV, I want to see dogs on the I TV. So, and I yeah. appreciate that. So last licks, we're going to feature a dog by the name of Russell. And this dog, Clint, has such a crazy story. So Russell was actually a dog that was in a war zone in Syria. And one of the paratroopers, the pararescue men that were out there, U.S. Uh, Army, was out there, saw him. He was like two, three months old and rescued him because he didn't want him to get harmed in Syria. Brought him back to the United States. He was like six or seven months old when he came back to the U.S., and now he is looking for his forever home. He's a good boy. He's a really good boy, um, but he's an active boy. He wants hikes and, and activity. And, you know, this is not a dog that wants to just sit around your house. So if you're an active, uh, you know, you like the outdoors, you want to hike, you want to get a good walk in. Uh, Russell is your boy. He's good with other dogs. He's fine without other dogs. Um, we wouldn't have him around cats. He's kind of got a prey drive, but, you know, whatever. Who likes cats? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I don't want any like negative. Don't tweet me about hating cats. I don't. People stop. Um, but anyway, Russell is available for adoption. Just contact us at GidriesGuardian.org. Yep. And to complete my thought tonight, uh, six o'clock on my channel, All Dodgers with Clint Pasillas. Hey, that's me. Going to be going in more on the Ipe and Shohei situation, more Dodgers talk, hopefully a lot more uh, fan comments and, and whatever. We won't have spicy Rizzo. I'm sorry, guys, but that was fun. Uh, uh, fun to see. Love, love seeing Alana, like the rest of the crowd, getting, getting spiced up here on the show. But check it out. Again, live 6 p.m. Pacific, uh, taking questions, taking comments, and uh, having a drink about it. Yeah, it's a, it was a lot to unpack today. Uh, glad yeah. to have you guys with us. But don't forget to, you know, of course, like Clint's show. All Dodgers go on YouTube, like it, subscribe. Do the same thing for us. We love having yeah. you participate in our show. We love you guys. Thanks so much. Go to Foul Territory. Subscribe, like us anywhere that you get your podcast, Dodgers Territory. For Clint Casillas, I'm Alana Rizzo. We'll see you on Monday. <laughs>